Yeah, we, we've seen, haven't we, that we're all under the problem of sin. It's been very clearly shown, Jews and Gentiles. The law couldn't make a man righteous. The scriptures prove that. But the Lord God has graciously provided, uh, provided a way in giving his son, whom he set forth to be a propitiation, okay, through faith in his blood. The, the Lord Jesus Christ is our mercy seat, our covering. Uh, and to have faith in his blood is to believe in his sacrifice. It's to believe that God was right to condemn sin and that the wages of sin should be death. Therefore, it was right that, that without the shedding of blood, there could be no remission of sins. And we saw that David was forgiven because of his recognition of sin. He knew that the law couldn't deal with his sin. And we saw that Abraham was counted righteous because of his faith in God. No works of law could save either of them. And God wants us to believe him, believe that he can deal with sin. He can bring life from the dead. Abraham believed that. And we concluded yesterday's study thinking about the implications of that in our lives today. When we are being challenged, do we believe in Genesis, in the, those early chapters? The answer is yes. What God says, we believe. And here in Romans, we have confirmed, don't we, that judgment that was made in Genesis 2, that the wages of sin is death. And in this chapter we've just read, that Romans 5 is teaching us that it was through Adam that sin entered into the world. Now, if we believe in evolution, the, the question arises, well, how then was death a punishment for sin? If Adam was already part of a process where things were living and dying for millions of years, it wasn't much of a punishment, was it? Furthermore, are we suggesting that, that God happily just tweaked his creation for millions of years, using death as just this means by which he could tweak it here and there? And then eventually, he decided to give his creation some purpose, so he picked out this one man, Adam. And we'd also be suggesting, wouldn't we, that actually at the beginning his creation wasn't very good. Far from it. It took millions of years for it to be very good. And fundamental to our study in Romans, we undermine the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. He declared God's right judgment that sin should die. If death had been around for millions of years and wasn't actually a consequence of sin, well, how was he declaring God to be right? And so can we see the importance of believing that all scripture is given by inspiration of God? And this is why we believe it's so important that we have the faith of Abraham. God spoke, Abraham believed. For those who will have his faith, that's what we've got to take on board. And of those sinners... God invites us through his grace to share in the victory of the Lord Jesus. He asks us to believe. For those who will respond in faith, we are amongst those who can stand and rejoice in hope of glory. Chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, being justified, made righteous by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith, Unto this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. But what we understand, don't we, brothers and sisters, is it still at this stage of our lives is a hope. This side of the kingdom, we will still experience the challenges of this life. Okay? But but the apostle then exhorts in verse 3, not only so. But we rejoice, we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, patience experience, and experience hope. And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit which is given unto us. Okay? So, what we see then, okay, is that we've been justified by God, we see that, we rejoice in the hope of glory. However, this side of the kingdom, we have to accept the challenges that we face and rejoice in those too, knowing that they are the very things that God is using to help to develop us, th those trials, developing our patience, to, to help us on our walk to the kingdom. 
And so for the believer, the, the proof, the experience, these things, these challenges are developing our faith, our, our hope in God more. So what I want to, you to see is that in verses 1 and 2 of chapter 5, you've got one idea, okay, the fact that we've been delivered, great, okay, and we rejoice, we, we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. But then verse 3 to 5, we've got another idea. We also now rejoice, that's the same word in the Greek, we rejoice in the tribulations of our lives. So, so number one, we have hope of the glory of God. Number two, we have the challenges of this life. And if I said to you, well, which of those do you prefer? The fact that you've got this hope of the glory of God or the challenges of this life? I'm sure that all of us would say, well, number one is where I feel most comfortable, just the fact that we've got this hope of the glory of God. And number two actually can make us worry, can't it? We can sometimes be scared that we may lose our faith through, through a trial, uh, some sort of trial that we perhaps we, we, we would worry that we wouldn't be able to cope with. And there's more uncertainty attached to number two than there is to number one. But look now at this, okay? You'll love this if you've not seen this. It's almost as if the apostle turns this on its head now. He says, if you can get your head around number one and have confidence there, you can be even more confident that number two will work out. And you're thinking, what is he on about? Let me show you. So there's the two ideas, okay? Yeah, we rejoice. This is what's got me onto this, these two same Greek words. We have been justified, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. That, what a great point to be. But we also have got to glory in these tribulations. We've also got to rejoice in the, the challenges of our lives. So we've got these two sections, okay? Now, what we then see is that the next bit of Romans, from verse 6 to 10, is going to deal with these two sections again. Verse 6, when we were without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we're yet sinners, Christ died for us. And so we see very much so that this ties in with here. That through the death of the Lord Jesus Christ, we've been justified, okay? And we love that. Okay, and that's, it's great, and we feel confident in that. But at the moment, we still feel unconfident in this. We worry about this. But look, verse 9, much more, get out your colouring pen, much more then, being now justified, we've been justified, there's number one, by his blood, but much more we're going to be saved from wrath through him. For if we were enemies... We were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Much more, having been reconciled, we're going to be saved by his life. And there's the key. Okay, so yes, we have been justified. That's number one. We were reconciled. That's number one. But now that we have been reconciled, much more we can be saved from wrath through him. We shall be saved by his life. We were justified by his death. Now he's living, okay? He's working to help us through these trials and through these tribulations. So have a think of it like this now. We'll just split the top and the bottom, okay? So the top. If we receive, number one, through the death of the Lord Jesus, we've been justified by the Lord Jesus Christ's death, by his victory there, how much more confidence we can now have in his life. So can you see the emphasis there? Through his death, we've received this. But now, much more through his life, we can cope. So it's just such a, a lovely thing that we can see there. And so then the summary verse is in verse 11. Not only so, we also joy, and there's our same word, rejoice in verse 2, glory in verse 3, and we see it repeated here now in verse 11. Not only so, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. So we rejoice in God because of this wonderful plan of salvation which we've been called to. We believe that God has justified us, so we rejoice in the hope of glory that we have. 
But we also believe that he's working through our lives now. So we rejoice too in the challenges of our lives, confident that God, through our Lord Jesus Christ, can save. The Lord Jesus Christ is alive and in the heavens, helping us through the challenges of our lives, moulding us to bring us to the kingdom. We have this hope of glory, okay? We have that through the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. But now that we are in the Lord Jesus Christ, now that we are there, He is working now alive in the heavens, helping us to bring us to the kingdom. What a wonderful thing that is. And you see, this argument is going to now repeat into more detail as we go into chapter 6 to 8. We've been saved, and therefore uh, we are delighted. But we trust now that God is working in our lives to help us to get to the kingdom. And of course, by its very nature, the second element is hard. We're going through trials. We're going through challenges to to, to mould us for that kingdom. And there's this dichotomy. Yes, I can see that the problems in my life are helping me to rejoice in the hope of God. You know, almost the more challenges I've got, the more I come to trust in God uh, and and to, to look to that hope of glory. But the problems of my mortality also undermine my confidence in God. And I guess all of us would have that that we we see that, yes, it's through these things that I come to trust, but it it can actually be through these difficulties that I can lose confidence too. And although the apostle here is exhorting us with the facts uh, there in verses 9 and 10, even with those facts, we can struggle to comprehend the power of the atonement in our lives now. You see, the atonement isn't about a one-off day where the Lord Jesus Christ died or or when we were baptised, when we were justified by God. The atonement is in the fact that God has given his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to get us to the kingdom. And to help us with that problem, that, that lack of confidence that we can have, the apostle, under inspiration, uses the most brilliant reasoning now to help us comprehend the power of the atonement. And it's this. Measure sin. Come on, let's wake up. Get your hands out, please. Hands up, okay? Show me with your hands how big is the problem of sin. How wide can you go? How wide can you go? You know? Okay, what what if I try and say measure this room? Well, we'd say here, wouldn't we? We'd go over to here. And we'd say, well, you've got to go all the way over to here. There's no sin is enormous. They're going right over to here. And I said, okay, all right, well, let's try and just measure it in the Bible school. Well, we'd have someone who stood at one end and someone stood at the other. If I said, let's try and measure it in British Columbia, we'd have someone stood at one and the other. If I said, let's measure it around the... It's, it's huge. It's enormous. It encompasses the world, doesn't it? That's how big the problem of sin is. And what we see here is that grace is much more. This is what Adam brought. It fills the graph. Okay. But look at this, and this is my PowerPoint skills just going to the, to the absolute limit. <laughs> look at that, okay? Off the screen, phenomenal, okay? But there, this is what we're being shown here. What a help that is. All of us can see how big a problem sin is, okay? We can't measure it, but we get, we can see the impact is enormous. What a help to be shown. Look, if you want to get your head around God's grace, well, just look at it in terms of the impact of sin. Sin is huge, but grace is much more. How helpful is that? So let's read this, verse 12. Wherefore, as by one man, Adam, sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. So every single one of us, we deserve to die. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. So we understand the law was given to show the exceeding sinfulness of sin. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that is to come. Now, you're going to see a contrast here. Not as the offence, so is the free gift. For if through the offence of one, many be dead... Much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. And so notice now the, the comparison, the contrast which is being made. 
If ever we feel it's too much, how can God deal with my problems, with my sin? If ever we were losing confidence going through the trials of life, come back to this part of Scripture. All of us are acutely aware that we are sinners. We grasp with comparative ease the fact that we've inherited a sin-prone nature from Adam. We see it. We feel it. But in these verses now, from verses 15 to 19, we're going to see this five-fold emphasis helping us see the extent of God's grace. So let's follow this left-hand column first of all then. So what you can see here, can't you, is I've just tried to put into a table just what the impact of Adam's sin and the impact of the Lord Jesus Christ's obedience. So we see the build-up. Just follow through from the top to the bottom now on that left-hand column. Through one man's offence, it's brought death and condemnation. It's big. It's brought in a reign of death that's brought all into condemnation. And how did it happen? It came about through this one man's disobedience. In contrast, let's look at the right-hand column. In the Lord Jesus Christ, many have life. And although sin is so powerful, one sin did so much damage, The grace of God is so incredibly powerful that it can deal with many sins. How good is that? So so we see the power of sin. One sin brought all this, but the grace of God can deal with many sins. That's how enormous the grace of God is. It's an abundance of grace. It can cover all, everybody. And how did it come about? It came through obedience to God. And it's lovely that Verse 15 started this by saying, not as the offence, so is the free gift. And it's great because although we are seeing these passages side by side and and, and looking there at their their kind of uh, similarities in a sense, really the point is to look for the difference. There's a contrast in quality and quantity. Adam's sin brought sin and death. Jesus' life of obedience brought righteousness and eternal life. Adam's one sin did all this, yet Jesus' obedience has brought life to many sinners. God's grace is much more powerful than sin. And in this chapter, there are definitely some words that you should colour. Okay? There you go. Six times the word man The word offence, the word death, comes through there in chapter 5. That's not me dictating the colour. You're allowed to choose that. You know that by now, okay? And seven times the word God and Christ. And isn't that lovely? Eight times grace. Grace is much more. Isn't it lovely that just even in the simple numbers, we're seeing that there is more power in God's grace brought to us through the victory of the Lord Jesus over sin than there is in Adam's offence. And so in verse 18, we're being drawn back to verse 12, where this phrase, all men, therefore as by the offence of one judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. So we, we see that phrase just going back there to verse 12. And it also reminds us of the fact that the Lord Jesus said that all men, okay, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. His uh, work would be able to deal with uh, the problem of sin for all men, for any. It doesn't matter if you're Jew or Gentile, male or female, bond or free. The gospel is for all men. And the final of the five emphases there in verse 19, put simply the fact that the huge impact of Adam's sin came about through disobedience. And in contrast, the wonderful impact of the Lord Jesus Christ came about through obedience. So the difference between Adam and the Lord Jesus was this. Adam was disobedient to God's will. The Lord Jesus Christ was obedient to God's will. And because of his obedience, an abundant blessing, the promises, the gospel has come to us. 
And in our baptisms, we became associated with him. We, we renounce the old man, our Adam nature, the man who brought sin and death. We don't want to be associated with that. What we want to do is associate ourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what we did in baptism, didn't we? We went down into those waters, said, I want to put to death that old man, and I want to come up and be part of the new man, associating myself with the raised Lord Jesus Christ. And so in chapter 6, he writes in verse 16, chapter 6, verse 16, Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves, servants to obey... His servants ye are, to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death, or of obedience unto righteousness. But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness." And so understanding the atoning work of the Lord Jesus Christ, seeing his obedience that we might be counted righteous, surely gives us a desire to obey. Seeing the Lord Jesus Christ's victory, recognising how much more good it has brought than Adam's sin, that's surely going to make a difference to our lives now. There is a huge emphasis in the world that we need to do this or that, grab out every opportunity we can for self. Understandably, in a sense, because from their perspective, this is all we've got. You could die today. But for us, it's different. We've been made free from sin. We're not going to die. We've been given the gift of righteousness, imputed righteous. God is working in our lives now. So, serve righteousness. Ensure your faith is the substance of your life. Don't worry about this or that, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Make that a priority. Make our lives God-centred. Don't focus on sin. That's what the Lord did for us. It kept making us aware of sin. It abounded. But we're not under the law. We're under grace. And therefore sin is dealt with in our lives. So we are going to focus on righteousness. And Paul gives now three examples going through chapter 6 and into chapter 7. He's showing how that we have left Adam's side and we're now cleaving to the Lord Jesus Christ. And first in chapter 6 we have the parable of baptism. We have a new life in baptism. And that's followed by the parable of service. We have a new master in the Lord Jesus Christ. And then we have the parable of marriage. We have a new husband in Christ. And so can you just see how these are broken up? You may have seen this before. Look at chapter 6 and verse 3. Know ye not? There's the baptism. Then chapter 6 and verse 16. Know ye not? There's the servants. And chapter 7 and verse 1. Know ye not? And there's the marriage. So can you see how you've got these three parables that are going through now to help us see? We've left Adam. Now, don't you realise? We've left that. We are now part of the Lord Jesus Christ. And all three examples are going to help deal with this uh, wrong conclusion that you see in chapter 6 and verse 1, where some have said, okay, well, if we live under grace, chapter 6 and verse 1, what should we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound. So all these three examples are going to show, no, 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 no. We don't continue in sin that grace may abound. We've left sin behind. We now are associated with the Lord Jesus Christ and with his right ways. Some were suggesting that you may remember right back from chapter 3 that Paul's teaching on grace and faith was some sort of subterfuge for sinning. Uh, In chapter 3, verse 8, we remember that some were suggesting, well, can we do evil that good may come? And here, when dealing with people who are hung up on this sort of legalistic mindset, convinced that our good works are what's there to save us, the apostle sort of treads carefully, but in the end, it's incredibly simple. People who can think they can save themselves by justifying themselves to God through their works, they are fools. They completely miss the enormity of the gap between us and God. 
between our imperfection and God's perfection. No amount of works bring us close to God. Nothing can. But that Judaistic mindset, you know, we could prove it happily another time, but that's what the apostasy came out of. You know, Zechariah 5 is a, is a prophecy about that, that, you know, in the end, the apostasy came out of Judaism. Catholicism, it's the same thing. It's a system of works, okay? And the, and the Muslims then almost took it to another level in the system of works. That is not going to save. But for those who come to appreciate God's perfection and are so truly humbled by the fact that he's offering us salvation. For those people, it can affect our lives positively because we see the privilege that it is ours to live, to have health and strength. We know what we are. We know that we're dust. But we can see that we've got blessings abounding in our lives. And we're so grateful for the fact that the God of heaven has reached out to provide salvation for us in his only son. And so we love the character of God and trust in his defining of what's right and what's wrong. And that understanding drives us. Life is a blessing and therefore every day that I live, me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. When we were baptised, that's the choice that we made. And so my summary of chapter 6, make your baptism the reality of your life. Chapter 6 is not an instruction to be baptised, okay? We sometimes read it a bit like that. It's not that. It's written to people who are baptised, and it's saying, make your baptism the reality of your life. Let's look at verse 4. When we were baptised with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin, for he that is dead is free from sin. Now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him knowing that Christ being raised from the dead, he dies no more, death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. And so our baptism was a public declaration that we agree with God, sin is wrong. That's what we did, isn't it, when we got baptised. We agreed that the flesh needs to be put to death. Well, when the Lord Jesus Christ was raised, he was free from sin. So what we're being exhorted to do is to make the positive choice to live with him. D don't live your life. Let Christ live in you. The decisions and actions that we're going to, to take in our lives, make with Christ in our minds. Not what would I do, what would the Lord Jesus Christ do? This is how my baptism is affecting me. I'm trying to make it the reality of my life. Well, the next little parable concentrates our minds on who is our master. Whilst living under grace, obviously frees us from the constraints of the law. More importantly, it's freed us from the death sentence. So the lives that we now live determine the choice that we make. I put that in the present tense because, of course, it is an ongoing choice. We have free will. What are we going to make a stand for? Who will we obey? Self and sin or God and his right ways? The Lord Jesus Christ, in his life, chose to obey God's right ways. He declared his righteousness. And five times in this little section, from verse 12 to 17, you'll see the word obey coming up. Shall I point them out? Are you ready? Verse 12, who are you going to obey? Verse 16, three times, obey, obey, obedience. Verse 17, 
Who have you obeyed? And interestingly, the word obey, I put it up on the screen in terms of the Greek and the Hebrew. Okay, so to whether you're looking in the Old Testament or the New Testament. Both, on both occasions, the word has its root in hearing. Okay, in the Hebrew, the word shema. It's lovely because really the point that God is saying is that for God to listen is to obey. In other words, whatever you listen to when God is speaking, you should obey. That's the crux, okay? It, it, it's not that we listen to God and then we think to ourselves, oh, I'll just probably do my own thing. No, to listen to God, we should obey. The two are basically synonymous. And in the Lord Jesus Christ, we see just that. I'm going to show you, we're going to go off on a little tangent. I'm going to show you one of my favourite points in, in Scripture. So we'll come back here, but first of all, let's go to Exodus chapter 16. We've gone off the notes, but hey, hey, we'll love it. In Exodus 16, Brother Richard's taken us here this week. The people in the wilderness, Israel in the wilderness, were given the manna. And we're just seeing now the example of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what we're drawing to now. To see how he, okay, obeyed. How he served God. How did he do this? And it's all to do with the fact that this word obey is related to the word to listen. So first of all, let's just look at this. Exodus 16 and verse 21 says about the manna that they gathered it every morning, okay? Now, that Hebrew phrase there, your, your, your uh, version might say they gathered it morning by morning, okay? And that's really a better phrase because it's the repetition of the Hebrew word for morning. It comes twice, now, that only happens 12 times in the Old Testament where we get the repetition of the word morning right next to itself, okay? So here we go. They gathered at the manna morning by morning. But why were they given the manna? Let's turn to Deuteronomy. Come to Deuteronomy. Why were they given the manna? Were they given the manna to just to feed them and to just uh, fill their bellies? Well, come to Deuteronomy chapter 8. It tells us specifically why they were given the manna. So they're given the manna morning by morning, every morning, morning by morning. And it says in Deuteronomy chapter 8 that in verse 3, the Lord God humbled thee and suffered thee to hunger and fed thee with manna, which thou knewest not, neither did thy fathers know. Why? That he might make thee to know that man doth not live by bread only, but by every word which proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. So they weren't given the manna to just simply feed them. They were actually given the manna to help them to realise that you don't simply live by bread alone, but by, that you live by the word of God. Now who, of course, got that? Come to Isaiah 50. This is a prophecy about the Lord Jesus Christ. Now read in Isaiah 50 and verse 4, speaking of the Lord Jesus, The Lord God hath given me the tongue of the learned, that I should know how to speak a word in season to him that is weary. He wakeneth morning by morning. He wakeneth mine ear to hear as the learned. The Lord Jesus Christ got it. He took mankind from the natural to the spiritual. He wasn't interested in getting up and taking, the, taking bread morning by morning, his breakfast. He, morning by morning, what he did is got up and wanted to listen to the word of God. That's what was his bread and butter, as it were. And of course, when he then went through trials and difficulties in his life, look at Matthew 4 and Luke 4, you'll see that the way that he dealt with it he turned to the scripture. Man doesn't live by bread alone, but by hearing the word of God. That's what he could see the importance of. The Lord Jesus Christ listened to the word. And that's then how he obeyed. So just let's finish this off. Go to Psalm 40. 
So through his open ear, morning by morning, okay, listening to the word of God, here in Psalm 40. He says in verse 6, again, it's the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, sacrifice and offering you didn't desire, but my ears have you opened. Burnt offering and sin offering have you not required. Then said I, lo, I come, and in the volume of the book it is written on me. I delight to do thy will, O my God. Yea, thy law is within my heart. And can you see there? He's saying, look, Lord God, I realise that what you want from me is an open ear so that I am prepared for you. And this is a lovely thing now. Hold Psalm 40 and come to Hebrews 10. You need both. Hebrews 10 and Psalm 40. This is such a helpful point. You see, in Hebrews 10, the inspired writer, he changes the quote from Psalm 40. In Psalm 40, he says, Sacrifice and offering as thou didst not desire, mine ear have you opened. And in Hebrews 10, he changes it. He says in Hebrews 10 and verse 5, Sacrifice and offering you would not, but not an ear that's been opened, but a body has thou prepared. Why is that changed there? Why has the inspired writer changed that? And surely the answer, brothers and sisters, is how was his body prepared? His body was prepared through the open ear. That is the crux. Those who will listen to the word of God morning by morning, make that what they're listening to. They are the ones whose bodies are prepared. And so let's go back now to where we left off in, in Romans. And hopefully you can see that the importance of this idea to obey. To obey. How do we obey? How are our bodies prepared to obey? It happens through the open ear to the word of God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And so then we see in that section that we were in, in chapter 6, from verse 12 down, another little key word which comes out. And it's this time it's the word yield. And that now comes five times, okay? So can you just note again, I can see two in verse 13. Perhaps you've got a version that says present, okay? Neither yield your members, but yield yourselves to God. Verse 16, who are you going to yield to? Okay, um, and you can see it again in verse 19 twice. So five times there. So that word means to stand by. And it perhaps helps to see the essential point here. Where does your loyalty lie? Who will you stand by? Who will you yield to? Is your life about you and pleasing yourself and serving sin? Well, you'll get sin's wages. Or is it about listening to and obeying God, standing by his right ways? Of course, there'll be times, many times when we fail. But if that's what our priority is, then God is willing to give us eternal life. Verse 22, being made free from sin and becoming servants to God, you have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Now, chapter 7's analogy then, the beginning of chapter 7, is, I think, really probably focusing on the Jew again a bit, those who've held on to the law. And he's helping those brothers and sisters with this extra analogy now of marriage, okay? So, so let's just read this one, verse 1 of chapter 7. Know ye not, there's our sort of key phrase again, isn't it? We're in this next paragraph, this next little section. Don't you realise, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. For the woman which hath an husband is bound by the law to her husband as long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loose from the law of her husband. And so a marriage is finished when one partner dies. Now remember, that although they were joined to the law, what have they now done? They've now been baptised. And what happens in baptism? Well, baptism is a symbolic death. And therefore, in being baptised, an individual has been made free from their previous relationship. 
in this case with the law. You died, therefore the law has got no hold over you. And on another level perhaps, your death was an association with Christ's death. And he fulfilled the law. It came to an end in him. So even the law has died. And so you most certainly are now free from the law when you've been baptised. So verse 3. So then, if while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law, so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also have become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. For when we are in the flesh, the motions of sin which were by the law did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. But now we are delivered from the law, that being dead wherein we are held, that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. And so the law, like sin, was a master over you. It brought forth a fruit. Can you see that? Just, let's just find this word fruit. Do you see how that at the end of verse 5, the law brought fruit unto death. And this is a helpful thing to see here, I think. You see, the law was like having sin as your master. Just look back to chapter 6 and verse 21. What fruit had you in those things whereof you're now ashamed? For the end of those things was death. So the fruit of living, just living your own life, okay? A life of sin brings death. But now, this is great. Look at the contrast. The fruit of our new relationship is a positive one. Chapter 7 and verse 4. Look at the end. Wherefore, my brethren, ye are become dead to the law through the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that ye should bring forth fruit unto God. And we see that paralleled with chapter 6 and verse 22. Now being made free from sin, become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness, and the end, everlasting life. So which fruit would we rather bring forth? The Lord Jesus' obedience has led for this wonderful opportunity for us. Let's use it and make positive choices in our life. And so we see the exhortation that we have a new life. So live that life. We're under a new master. Serve that master. But in a lovely way, we see that it's not a service of tick boxes. It's a service of love. We have a new husband. Let's love that husband. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Of course not. We chose to leave the old man in the grave. We're no longer serving King Sin. Our service is to God. We're seeking first his kingdom and his righteousness. And what a wonderful blessing it is that he's provided the Lord Jesus Christ as a helpmeet there for each of us to help us to get to the kingdom. Well, what a lovely thing it is that the example that we've got to follow, the Lord Jesus, and we've said this before, we'll say it again, and we'll say it again and again and again until the kingdom comes, that his example is the loveliest man that ever walked this earth. And we're being asked, try to be like him. What a, what, what a blessing. There are those who think that they're calling in this life is to do terrible things and yet we see that what I want you to try to do is look to this man look to this man who didn't worry about himself who looked to try to serve others who was altogether lovely no secular history speaks anything bad of him he was the loveliest and like if you struggle to get your head around that just think now of the loveliest person that you know I know a few and then think, this man was a million times nicer than them. And that's your challenge. That's your challenge today. Why wouldn't we want to live a new life? To serve a new master? To love this new husband? To have that lovely challenge every day? How can I today try to be a little bit more like the Lord Jesus Christ? What an amazing thing we've been called to. And you know, that... Greek word in verse 21 of chapter 6. Those things that we were ashamed of, okay? Sins of the past. That particular word 
Okay, the word shame does come through, but that particular word is only used one other time, and it's in chapter 1 and verse 16, where he's talking about the gospel in which he's not now ashamed. And it's lovely because we've got this great contrast. In the gospel, we have something that we don't need to be ashamed of. Adam and Eve in the garden felt ashamed and they hid. Sin is shameful. But now we boast our glory is in God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We're not boasting in works of the law. We know that we fail. Our boast, our glory is in Christ and his victory. The lives that we now live are to Christ. 